Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my fantastic co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, and today we are interviewing Charlie Schumacher, uh, Director of Corporate Communications at Marathon Mining. How are you doing today, Charlie? Very well, thank you for having me. Nice. Well, we are glad to have you here for sure. Uh, and well, to kick us off, I've got a very simple question for you. Uh, Director of Corporate Communications. It sounds pretty impressive. Uh, what does your role actually entail? Of What do you do at Marathon? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, thank you. Yeah, it is. It, it does sound impressive. It's good for my ego. It's nice. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the joke I like to tell people is that um, I'm in charge of all the words at Marathon. Um, so my background, uh, prior to Marathon, I was in the investor relations world. I used to work at an agency. Uh, Marathon was actually a client of mine. I was kind of the Bitcoin guy at the office and happy to go to that if you guys want the whole story. But um, the uh, so I kind of came on on board originally is I think predominantly just to run IR for the company. Um, mining's a weird industry in that we don't, there's no product differentiation because we all make Bitcoin, it's all fungible. And we don't have any customers because we just hold all of our Bitcoin today. So when we're thinking about our communications efforts, we're, we're a publicly traded company. So if we're not fighting for customers, we're not trying to build a network, really what we're doing is, I guess you could argue fighting for investor mind share. And so the IR side was sort of the priority, at least initially on our communication side. Um, so that's really what I was originally brought in to do was kind of beef up the investor relations side of things. Uh, that has evolved very quickly into uh, doing not just the IR stuff, but also PR. So I run our social media. Um, I'm technically, I think, in charge of all the words on the website, uh, help with our kind of government relations, anything that's kind of education based for the business. So uh, between Fred and myself, we're uh, sort of the two um, communications or mouthpieces for the business, if you would. I was about to ask you, do you I assume you play guitar, right? You've got a, a, guitar, is that a guitar, it looks like it's six. Yeah, strings. it is. Yeah, um, I do. I uh, I used to play a lot when I was when I was younger. Um, these days, it's uh, you know, it's it's more, I guess, of like a therapeutic tool for me more than anything else. Um, uh, but it is funny when I when I moved into this apartment and put it up, I didn't realize it was going to be as such a prominent position for all my Zoom calls. So now I'm always having to. <laughs> you know, explain why there's a, there's a guitar on the wall and make sure people understand that I'm working for marathon and not over here just playing guitar all day long. <laughs> Either sounds good, man. You said you deal with like investor relations. Mm -hmm. um, I know Blockstream has like a mining certificate. Does marathon have like some sort of financial instrument that people are investing in or are they buying like the mining machines? Uh, so actually neither. So we're, we're a publicly traded company. We're listed on NASDAQ. We were one of the first Bitcoin miners to be listed on NASDAQ. Um, there's now a ton, right? It's amazing how the space has changed. A year ago, there were just a handful of publicly traded miners, like maybe five or so. Um, I think where we're at today is there's 24 to 30, somewhere in that range. It's like every day I see a new, you know, announcement about a new company coming in, coming public in the Bitcoin mining space. So it's, it's changed quite drastically, but no, we don't have a, we don't have any consumer facing products. Um, we don't, we don't offer financial services. We don't sell machines. We don't manufacture machines either. Um, we, as a business essentially just purchase machines. And then we actually don't even plug them in ourselves. We outsource that part of the business. Um, happy to go into this, but we've got a very different strategy from kind of most other Bitcoin miners out there. We're not trying to vertically integrate. We don't own real estate. We don't own data centers. Um, our kind of philosophy is all about trying to generate the highest return on assets or return on investment for our shareholders. And we believe the best way to do that is just to buy and own assets that generate revenue. Um, so Bitcoin miners, right? Uh, they're like little internet money printing presses. Um, so we essentially just buy those from manufacturers, own those and kind of outsource everything else pretty much as our business. Yeah, if you could uh, give some more information, because I mean, uh, I guess from a basic perspective, you'd, you'd think if you're buying the miners, you'd want to potentially own or at least, I don't know, rent where they're stored and have some kind of input yeah. into uh, other things. Like, are you, cause you literally, you're owning the miners. Are you, are you, do you have employees or are you literally just completely outsourcing every aspect of the, you know, like, so there's, is there someone looking after the machines or is that someone who doesn't work for you or does work for you? How does that work out? Really good question. Um, 
we yeah we do have employees uh but not a ton um so we're today i think we're we're all the way up to 11 full-time employees um which is always surprising to people when they kind of you know look at who we are as a business um we are adding to that um you know there's there's more we're at a point i think we're just commensurate with our scale it one makes sense to have more resources internally but two also we're very much focused on looking at different ways that we can grow the business um and so it's just useful to have you know more hands on deck more talent internally for stuff like that um but no to go back to your question about sort of how we're structured um so we essentially we purchase mining hardware machines from manufacturers bitmain is who we predominantly buy from i think we're most probably their single largest customer um, at least in terms of hash rate uh, or even in terms of units of machines probably so to date we've purchased 199,000 machines that uh, we're expecting all of those to be online probably early next year so early 2023 and that'll put us at 23.3 exahash which is like the big metric in our industry right what's your hash rate that's what everyone talks about um, it's, uh, and that will make us by far, I think the largest, at least of people who've contracted for equipment were the largest among public miners, um, based on those projections. Uh, we partner with a company called compute North, who actually is the company that builds our data, that builds the data center, if you would, and then we populate it with our miners. So one analogy I, I found helpful for people is you could think that compute North is like building shopping malls and we're their anchor tenant. So we'll come into the space and either use, you know, 100% of the capacity they have available, or we'll use, you know, a large percentage of it, and then they'll sell the rest of the rack space to other miners who are looking for somewhere to host their machines, um, which is a big thing today. There's a lot of miners who are trying to come into the U.S. and looking for places to host their equipment. Um, so Compute North, I think, is in a pretty good pos position from that perspective. And then uniquely because we're agile we actually kind of have this three-way structure with agreements now where we work not just with compute north for hosting but we also partner directly with large-scale renewable power companies to deploy our machines so there's kind of a three-way structure here if you think about the different pieces to the puzzle that make up bitcoin mining in some ways it's a very simple uh business and industry you basically need a power source uh and you need the machines and then you need that connected you just need the machines hooked up to power and you need them connected to the internet so they can work on the Bitcoin protocol. Um, so the three of us, it's it's not partnerships too strong of a word, but the three companies working together actually works very well. We bring the miners uh, to the table, renewable power companies supply the power, and then Compute North kind of sits in the middle to help build out the infrastructure and connect the two parties. Did, um, why, why, why this business model? I'm trying to understand. Like you said, it's pretty um, unorthodox and quite different from what it's what is out there? So why did you guys decide to opt for this business model? And is this going to change anytime soon? <laughs> Good question. Um, it is a little unorthodox and it's pretty different from the way the industry used to operate. Um, so most people today are trying to vertically integrate in mining, or that's the buzzword that people are using. Technically, I don't think you're really vertically integrated unless you own your power. So, you know, it depends on what you want to define as vertical integration. But um, the theory behind owning hosting facilities is that you can reduce your operating expenses. That's the primary reason people went after doing it. And we actually tried that. We did do this once. Um, our facility in Hardin, Montana, which is where most of our machines are running today, um, we have about 30,000 machines running at a facility there. We actually did attempt to vertically integrate. We don't own the source of power. We don't own the power station there, but we built, we paid the sort of the CapEx, if you would, for the data center and the switch gear. Um, and we have, uh, we contract with someone to actually host the miners for us. So we did kind of do that attempt. The theory, what's interesting. So the theory was that you could save money on your OPEX if you're vertically integrated. The reason that it, the math doesn't really pencil though is the single biggest input cost by far to running a mining operation is power. So unless you own your power, you're not actually reducing your operating expenses that much. And interestingly, what we found is actually because of our scale, we actually have lower cost to operate by outsourcing everything than we do by trying to build a data center. So you can think about it like this, right? Um, if you, a data center could cost, depending on your size of scale, um, let's just take like 100 megawatts, for example, which is about 30,000 Bitcoin miners, depending on the model. Um, it's going to cost you anywhere between probably 35 and $50 million to build the data center. 
If you do that, you may be able to save about 10% on your operating expenses because you didn't, because you're not paying to rent space from somebody else. But if you were to go out and take 30 or $50 million and buy Bitcoin miners, which make Bitcoin at 80 plus percent margin, like what's the return on that investment, right? So it really came down to just capital allocation. Um, we get a way higher return by owning magic money printing presses, if you would, right? Than we do by owning real estate and data centers. There's lots of other reasons for it. I'm happy to go into them if you guys want, but that's really kind of the basic uh, thought behind the philosophy. It seems like a smart move, like to focus in on something, right? Like you guys have to focus in on specifically one thing you're very, very, very good at. And then you can leave the hassle of looking after all these physical areas and centers and rent and power to someone else. But um, yeah, go, if there's any more reasons, please, uh, please divulge. No, I mean, that's, you're spot on, right? It's like, it's kind of specialization, right? Like, let's do what we're good at, right? Which is vetting equipment, building relationships with vendors, running kind of the logistics of that. And like, let's let other people who are good at what they do and experts in their field do their thing. Um, so part of it is this business is changing. Bitcoin mining has been around for as long as Bitcoin, right? But it's, it just became a teenager, right? This year, um, it's 13 years old, right? Um, and we're in a very, very early stage of this industry starting to become more professional and kind of moving to like an enterprise scale, if you would. Again, as we said, at one point there were what, like five publicly traded Bitcoin miners. There's almost 30 now. Um, and I know this from just having worked kind of on the IR side with Marathon for a while, but a year and a half ago, there was zero institutional interest, like no traditional um, investment managers, portfolio managers, hedge funds would touch this space. Um, today, Marathon, just for reference, is about 35 to 40% institutionally held. So you've seen this like massive transition on kind of the capital market side. Um, and I think that that is also driving kind of innovation on the hardware and the rest of the industry. Um, so we're big believers that the hardware and kind of all of the infrastructure of this industry is going to change very drastically over the next few years. Um, we think the world's kind of moving to immersion cooling is one example of that. Um, which, by the way, if you build a data center and it's all designed to be air cooled, you have to redesign it completely to do immersion cooling. So the lifetime of building data set, data centers don't actually have a very long lifetime, depending on how the industry evolves, maybe five years, but not 20 years. So that's another reason we don't want to be in that business is just the lifetime of, you know, a data center is not super long. Um, the other part of it, though, is and then the hardware equipment itself is going to change drastically. If you think about today, what a Bitcoin miner looks like, it's like a little shoebox. It's like a desktop computer. You know, it was designed that like that design was meant for someone who has like five in their garage. Right. Um, or, you know, their wife gets pissed off at them and they have to move them into a warehouse somewhere. Right. But it's meant to just be like a few at a time. It's not meant to have 100,000 in a warehouse. So we think that the entire hardware side of the market is going to get redesigned. Um, what does that do to the infrastructure again, right? Does it go to immersion? Do, uh, so we think there's just a lot of moving parts at the moment. Um, but the other interesting piece of this puzzle, and this is maybe like one of the, the I think some, a way that this industry is going to evolve that Fred and I, have, my CEO and I have been talking about for a while, but I don't think most people realize quite yet is that the power companies are going to be the Bitcoin miners of the future because they own the single biggest input costs. And if today large scale power companies are very interested in learning about Bitcoin mining and tons of reasons for that, happy to go into that. Um, they're all looking to kind of dip their toes into this space. And they're, to do that, they need to partner with someone who has a lot of excess machines and is able to deploy their facilities. If you're building data centers, you're fixed in a single location, right? You're stuck wherever you built your data center. That means that you don't have the option to kind of get up and move. It also means that you potentially have risk from a regulatory perspective, right? There's a lot of talk around how the regulation is going to evolve with Bitcoin mining. If the state decides to shut you down, you're stuck, right? You've, you have a massive sunk cost with your data center. You can't just pick up the infrastructure and move it. If you only own machines, you can pick them up and move them wherever you want. Um, if you build a data center, you're most probably signing a PPA with a power company, which means you're contracted to eat a certain amount of power because we don't build data centers. We don't have to do that. Um, Compute North, our hosting provider, bears that risk and that burden. Um, 
And so because we just own machines, we not only are very asset light, like we kind of have this, this de-risked business model, if you would, it's higher return on assets, but it also positions as well for how we think the industry is going to evolve. So it puts us in a really good position to start having conversations with large scale power companies and help teach them how to mine Bitcoin, essentially. You mentioned renewable energy. How much of Marathon's energy consumption is based on renewables? So by the end of this year, we've put out a target to be 100% carbon neutral. Um, that's predominantly going to be renewable power. We haven't said exactly what the mix of it is long term, but so we're, we have 30,000 machines roughly running today. I think 32 is what we said at the start of January. Um, most of our fleet at this point is being deployed in Texas uh, behind the meter at wind and solar farms operated by one of the largest renewable power companies in North America. Uh, we haven't said who they are, neither of they. There's, you know, they're being a little cagey. I think they'll be public about who they are soon, but stay tuned on that one. Um, so we operate directly at the source of power, which, by the way, if you want to say you're using green energy, which is important for us, um, the only way you really know that is to be at the source of power, right? Because like similar to Bitcoin being fungible, like an electron's an electron, right? Like <laughs> it's you can't tell if you're which where exactly where it came from once it's kind of in the grid and going through the power system. So if you want to know with certainty that you're using kind of green energy or renewable power, you need to be at the source of power generation. Um, we're deploying in Texas in a really big way. Um, and the Texas grid itself, the ERCOT grid, I think it's over 60% uh, renewable power um, just as a whole, like as a mix. And so what we're doing with most of our locations is we're directly at sources of power, but as I'm sure you guys all know, like wind and solar are intermittent power sources. They're not perfectly stable, right? That's part of the challenge with like the world trying to move to renewable sources. And so what we also have is we have a grid connect um, at these locations. So if we're in a situation where, you know, the sun's not shining as much or the wind's not blowing as much and we need to pull excess power, we can pull off of the grid. And that's, again, about 60% renewable itself. And then we'll offset the discount with carbon Rex, uh, which we also purchased from the power company because of that relationship we have there. So it's hard to say exactly what the total percentage of like pure green power is, if you would. Um, and I know that the carbon neutral thing like carries baggage for some folks because it's like, well, how are you establishing that? Um, but we're predominantly going to be renewable power directly and then offset uh, with carbon recs for, you know, the mix, if you would, from the grid connect. It's, it's funny to me because like um, a lot of the uh, stuff we've heard for the last, I don't know how many years about Bitcoin being super dangerous and terribly horrible for the environment it seems to be kind of dying down a little bit as people started to realize that it feels actually like mining is, is becoming i mean just to me anyway from what i'm seeing on on the media is that mine is kind of going from being this devil to actually slowly becoming like the darling of bitcoin to a degree because people are starting to realize that oh actually wait a second you know where there's like uh too much energy being wasted actually we could use that uh yeah. you know and actually do something with that oh well, surprise surprise you know um, so it feels like it's almost the other way around. People are interested in kind of like how originally it was like, oh, not crypto, blockchain. You know, that's what we're interested in. It's now become like not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin mining seems to be like the yeah. thing that people are interested in. Do so you see, um, I think it's only a few hours ago, Putin came out um, and has like halted the, the Bank of Russia, I think it's Bank of Russia, whatever, whoever it is in Russia that was trying to ban Bitcoin. He said, wait a second, we've got like, you know, we've got lots of energy we could potentially use here. And <laughs> it might, this might be favorable for us to mine Bitcoin. I don't know if you saw it or yeah. not, but um he came out literally just a couple of hours back, I think it was, that I saw the article. Um, so it does feel like there's a lot of changes uh, going on. But do you guys feel pressure from investors to get to the carbon neutral side of things? Is, is that where, is there a lot of pressure coming from people who are actually investing in you guys for you to do that? Or, or how much, like, I wondered where that's coming from. Like if it's just an internal decision or if it's like a pressure from investors thing or, or pressure from just outside sources. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. I mean, it is very much kind of an internal philosophy and something, you know, we, we care deeply about at Marathon. I think everyone in kind of the organization does. Um, it is also like, honestly, a very good business decision. Um, so, you know, selfishly maximizing profits for shareholders, like this is a very good way to do it, um, which I'll go into in just a second. Um, 
Cause I think that's like, that's something that people didn't realize like a year ago. Um, and actually in a lot of ways still don't. Um, but then, yeah, there's, you know, there's a really big ESG movement among the institutional investor community. Some of that's generational, but like, I don't think that's going away. Like we think that's here to stay. So it is also, you do get, you know, you get pressure from lots of different angles for it, but it predominantly comes for us like intrinsically philosoph philosophically the way that we want to run the business. Um, What's interesting though, and I think this is, you know, kind of to your point, um, Lawrence, about the way that like people are changing their perspective of Bitcoin mining. Um, even now we're still kind of fighting this battle of like Bitcoin just sucks away the world's energy and it's all, you know, it's propagating and keeping up uh, fossil fuel plants, um, which really like really isn't the case. I think a year ago that argument was much more valid when China banned Bitcoin mining, which was almost entirely coal operated, um, you saw all of that change, right? So you just saw the energy mix of the entire industry change in a couple months. And something unique about the United States is there's a, we have an excess of power in this country, which is very different from lots of other places in the world. So Europe, for example, is having a lot of problems with energy at the moment because they, they made a transition to renewables too aggressively and too quickly, and they shut down all their nuclear. And so as a result of that, they're actually having to fire up old diesel plants um, in order to like offset and use as like base load power. Um, we don't have that issue today in the US. I think we're making that transition a lot more slowly and hopefully more strategically. But if you think about the way that kind of power consumption works, supply and demand have to always be balanced on the grid because there's no large scale batteries for power, which I don't, which is something I didn't know before I really got into Bitcoin mining. Um, you know, I just, I plug things into my wall and it works, right? Sometimes uh, like if it's super hot in the summer here in California, power goes out and that's just like, why, right? Like I, I had no idea. Um, the issue is that power and so supply and demand have to be perfectly balanced because there's no battery storage. Um, the issue with renewables is once you get them online, so there's it's essentially like infinite energy if you can capture it, right? But that means that you will either have too much energy or too little energy, depending on when consumers need it. So more simply, uh, the most power you're going to get from solar, right, is going to be in the middle of the day when the sun is shining. But that's not really when people are coming home from work, watching Netflix and flipping on their air conditioners or their heaters, right? That all happens from like 5 to 9 p.m. Um, so that's really when it peaks. Um, so what that means is as we build out more and more renewable power, there's actually more and more excess energy um, in the United States specifically. Uh, where I live in California, there's, there's really interesting case studies that we've done um, and Fred and I have presented at conferences where every year we've curtailed, which means sort of wasted, more and more electricity because we're adding more and more solar. So part of the argument is, well, what if we just took a bunch of Bitcoin miners and hook them up to these, to these power grids? And rather than wasting the electricity, why don't we use Bitcoin miners as a capacitor, as a load balancer? Um, why don't we take that, that wasted local energy and turn it into something that has global value that can then be, that's digital money, right? That can then be traded to actually subsidize the build out of new renewable power facilities, or at a local community level, you could even think of it as um, subsidizing the electricity of a local community. Um, we as a business, right, we, we hold it as assets on our balance sheet, and that's beneficial for our shareholders. But I think there's, there's actually this perfect marriage because of the lack of battery storage today that exists in power markets. There's actually a perfect marriage between renewable power and Bitcoin mining. Um, but I think that's an educational process. I don't think most people get that. I do think you're right. I think we're moving in that direction. Um, but today, the, the biggest misconception that we're always having to fight is that people believe power is a zero sum game. They think that if we're using energy, we're taking it away from somebody else. Um, and that's just not the case because no, we don't pay what consumers pay for electricity, right? We're the, we're the consumer of last resort for electricity. So we basically only go where there's excess or free power.